Welcome, everybody. My name is Campbell Rogers. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at HeartFlow, and it is my privilege to host today's webinar, Utilizing Lesion-Specific Physiology and Quantified Plaque to Inform Decision-Making. Uh, it's also my privilege to welcome our two faculty for this webinar. First, Dr. Frank Corrigan. Dr. Corrigan is at Wellstar in Atlanta and practices both and as an interventional cardiologist and as an advanced cardiac imager with focus on cardiac and coronary CTA. Dr. Corrigan, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Uh, well, thank, thank you so much uh, for joining us and uh, we're excited to share some cases. Um, hopefully this is thought provoking and uh, provides a little bit of insight into the way um, we think we're gonna be evaluating patients in the future. Right. And then second, go back one, Frank, for a second. The okay. second is to welcome Dr. Sarah Reinhardt. Dr. Reinhardt is the Medical Director of Cardiac Imaging and, and the Program Director in the Cardiac Cardiology Fellowship at Charleston Area Medical Center in Charleston, West Virginia. Uh, Dr. Reinhardt, thank you so much for taking time from your busy life and busy practice uh, to join us in this educational session. Welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to take part today. So Dr. Corrigan, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you to walk through our first our first case. Okay, uh, fantastic. Well, thank you. Um, so the first case I wanted to show is a 50-year-old man who had been having suspicious uh, chest discomfort with exertion. Um, and, and what I first wanted to point out is he is 50 years old Based on his lipid profile, the fact that he does not have diabetes, he's not a, he's not a smoker, his 10-year ASCVD risk was calculated at 5.6%. Um, he had very typical symptoms and underwent coronary CT angiography. And we can see the uh, FFRCT to the right um, that shows a critical proximal LAD lesion. We'll show the images shortly. Um, but importantly, he had a zero calcium score and his 10-year ASCVD risk is in the range where one might consider a statin. Here are his CT images. Importantly, his calcium score is zero, but you can see that he has critical stenosis in his proximal LAD. Now, as we know, a calcium score is really a surrogate for non-calcified plaque, but non-calcified plaque must precede calcified plaque. And here we're catching this patient earlier in his process of atherosclerosis. Looking at the plaque in his LAD, he has uh, 196 cubic millimeters of non-calcified plaque, 26% of which is low attenuated plaque. Uh, that calculates to about 13% of that lesion is low attenuated, high risk fatty plaque. Um, and additionally, using a nomogram uh, from patients who have undergone plaque analysis with heart flow, um, his black burden falls at about the, the 70th percentile. So using this, yes, he does have an obstructive lesion causing symptoms, but we know a lot more about his risk from assessing his black um, that we would not have otherwise. If he had had um, less suspicious symptoms, maybe, maybe we wouldn't have done any testing at all based on his low risk and zero calcium score. He was able to go to the cath lab. These are some still images of his coronary angiography. He certainly had a critical proximal LAD lesion that underwent successful PCI. He went home the same day. Um, but what I wanted to really draw our attention to is the fact that a calcium score is really a surrogate for non-calcified plaque. 80% of all plaque is non-calcified. And using a plaque analysis or a coronary CT for that matter allowed us to understand that yes, this guy certainly has a more elevated cardi cardiovascular risk than a risk score would, um, would demarcate. Uh, but, but on top of that, we were able to uh, bring him to the cath lab and get him feeling better. Um, so on an individual level, I think the 10-year ASDVD risk score didn't really work for this patient just based on the fact that he has pretty severe high-risk coronary artery disease and that could have um, otherwise gone unnoticed if he had had less typical symptoms. 
Great. Thank you for presenting that case, Dr. Corrigan. Uh, Dr. Reinhardt, let me ask you first for your thoughts with your area of focus, both in imaging and also in preventive cardiology for this case and this presentation. And then uh, some lessons from the recently published, actually published yesterday, DECODE study, which you led that may speak to this, uh, to this patient. Yeah, so this patient is very interesting. And it, again, it, it, it highlights that we can't rely on a calcium score. And sometimes when I'm talking to the patients, I say the calcium score will become more positive no matter what we do because it's stabilizing. But we we the advantage of the plaque analysis is it gives us the components of all of the plaque, not just one part. And when calcium progresses, we don't know if it's stabilization of disease versus progression of disease, which I think is important when we're thinking long term. But this patient, just because he had a stent, you know, he has a, a high grade lesion in, in a bad location. So when we're talking about just that high grade stenosis, he warrants very aggressive LDL lowering with at least an, a high intensity statin and probably less than 55 of an LDL cholesterol. If we were thinking about once we started that therapy, how would we change things for this patient going forward? We would say this patient is at higher risk, right? Because number one, you have complete non-calcified plaque burden with a high low attenuation plaque, but also you have residual risk, right? You have those triglycerides that are a residual risk factor. So once you get your LDL to where you would want, um, you, you would think about what else do I need to look at? Because this patient has disease out of proportion to what we would expect. So again, would we probably have voted to intensify therapy on this patient? Probably because of his triglycerides, the location of the plaque, the, com uh, the complexity of the non-calcified plaque. So I think all of those factors plus the percentile on the nomogram would force us to increase the intensification of his therapy. Right, thank you. And I, I wanna move on to the to the DECODE study, Sarah, in a second. First, before we do, there is a question in the Q&A, a procedural question, Dr. Corrigan. So let me pose this to you. Uh, did you use additional tools in the cath lab, for example, invasive physiology measures or IVUS? And how do you think about those in a world where, I'll add this to the question, when you're heading into the cath lab, having seen CT, having seen the FFR CT, uh, having some information about plaque distribution, uh, ahead of time. So speak a little bit about that. And then Sarah, we'll come back to you to talk about decode. Sure. Um, now, Campbell, it's an excellent point. Uh, going into the cath lab, we knew what this patient had. Um, if we were using stress tests in the past, uh, we would go to the lab and essentially uh, just look and see what's there. Um, going into the cath lab, we have, you know, we, we're able to talk to the patient and really explain, hey, look, you've got a proximal LED lesion. This, you know, does, it, it may be a little more complicated than a usual PCI, um, but, you know, I, it's it's a large territory. I think you're going to feel a whole lot better after we complete the case. Um, and then going into it, we're able to size the vessel based on CT. Um, this vessel approximately measured five millimeters. So going into the case, I kind of had a good idea of what equipment I needed. Um, so... Uh, we did not use FFR in this case, um, primarily because we already knew the um, the functional significance based on the FFR CT value. But, you know, I did use IVIS. Uh, I've heard people say, well, if you know the vessel size, do you need IVIS? I, I, I think you do, especially afterwards, just to make sure you're well opposed. But but yes, you know, maybe up front, um, you, you, you already know balloon sizing. So, you know, potentially we could use CT a little more to plan these procedures. Great, thank you. All right, Dr. Re Dr. Reinhardt, let's come back to you to talk a little bit about decode, please. All right. So one of the things that I think is very is interesting when we're talking about plaque assessment is we know that the total plaque volumes from prior studies are associated with worse outcomes. But what we did not really know was what the clinical utility of using this plaque analysis would be in guiding our treatment decisions. So that is what led to the DECODE uh, study. 
uh, which I think is very uh, important. And we had three physicians who were very um, prevention minded, but also level three cardiac CT readers. And we looked at the CT report and then we chose a stage of therapy. And as you can see, most of us chose stage two, which included aspirin and statin therapy. And we were actually surprised by the results because we were um, all felt we had a great idea about how much disease burden was there. What we found is that there's a limitation in the report, but even with looking at images, the plaque analysis tool was very helpful because we were able to see on those images as well as on the quantitation of the plaque, how much we are underestimating the non-calcified plaque that's there. So we maintain therapy in about a third of those patients, but two thirds of the patient, we reclassified their treatment strategi strategies primarily by intensification of the stage of therapy that they were on. And I think this study highlights and found utilities and thought provoking questions about how we can use this plaque analysis tool more effectively. And so I'm going to go through a case. Uh, this is one of my patients. Uh, and I will kind of walk through how I would uh, evaluate this patient using plaque analysis, but also other tools as well. So she's a 40-year-old female who's had high cholesterol for a very long time. Her friends convinced her to have a calcium score. And you can see it's 421. Um, so this is a 40-year-old female, so it's very advanced for her age. And remember, a calcium score of 300 has the same risk as someone who has clinical ASCVD with prior revascularization. And for, for those non-preventive cardiologists in the room, we're actually able to get in several places PCSK9s approved with calcium scores over 300 now, which is important as we go through these discussion points. So as we look towards this case, she has a familial form of hyperlipidemia, heterozygous FH, uh, with a high Dutch lipid score. But she also has other risk-enhancing features. Uh, she has an elevated LP little a, which is often found in patients with familial hyperlipidemia. But she also has had a prior miscarriage and also had preeclampsia during her second pregnancy. Her LDL, when we checked it after she saw me in the clinic, was 256. Um, and her LP little a was elevated. So again, her Dutch lipid score was seven consistent with probable FH. And so we rapidly titrated up her statin. So the one thing I wanna highlight is um, anyone with an LDL of more than 190, there's no risk assessment required. You automatically start that high intensity statin because her lifetime risk when calculated was 39%. So as we look through her coronary CT images, you can see the very diffuse nature of the disease. You can see there's a significant lesion in the right, but also in some of these diagonals, there's dense regions of calcification and maybe a moderate stenosis in that obtuse marginal. So as we look forward to her FFRCT, you can see there's definitive lesion-specific ischemia in that right coronary artery, but also in these diagonals, you can see the, uh, an FFR that's technically positive, but in the gray zone. And she also has a delta or a change over that obtuse marginal lesion. So she was having somewhat um, anginal equivalent symptoms. Uh, so she did undergo a cath. Uh, intervention to the right, she's asymptomatic and the diagonals were left alone at that time and her medical therapy was titrated. So I think important from the CADRADS, whether you have these plaque analysis tools or not, anytime you have a stenosis of more than 50%, the recommendations are for more aggressive medical therapy. But also when you have plaque three or four burden, and that can equate to a calcium score over 300 or segments involved of more than five, it warrants more aggressive risk factor modification. But the problem with some of this is what is aggressive to one person may not be aggressive to another. So are we really reaching these targets and how are we tracking these changes over time? So when you use the heart flow plaque analysis, the first thing I wanna say is it's very accurate. The reveal plaque study actually showed high accuracy of 
percent agreement with IVIS, and it's very comprehensive when we look at all the plaque components, and we're going to demonstrate how it is actionable. So when we look at our patient's uh, plaque analysis, she is more than the 90th percentile uh, for her total plaque volume, and you can see that diffuse nature but her total plaque volume was over 577. And again, huge proportion, 84% of non-calcified plaque, and there is low attenuation plaque as well. So when we're trying to stage her, we actually have developed a staging algorithm of mild, moderate, severe, and extensive based on these total plaque volumes. And because her plaque volume was more than 250, She's in the severe stage, and we put targets of LDL associated with that of less than 55. Um, so you want it less than that. But we said if you have risk enhancers or a high percentile on that Novogram, to consider going to the next stage. And she has more than the 90th percentile, and she has multiple risk enhancers. So she needs to be as low as can be reasonably achieved. Uh, in regards to her LDL and preventive therapy. Because remember, she had that elevated LP little a, she had a pregnancy resulting in miscarriage, plus she had preeclampsia. So as we go forward, uh, we see the reason we say that the severe plaque volume is more than 250 is partly from this study that shows when your plaque volume is more than 238, you have a significantly increased hazard ratio of events. So as the event rate increases, as the total coronary plaque volume grows, which is quite significant. So when I looked at how I would approach this with DECODE, again, if you didn't have this information, again, at minimum, she needs a high intensity statin. Most likely we would know with that LDL cholesterol, we would have chosen at least stage three because we knew she would need a PCSK9 on top of that. But we chose three plus because we knew that she would probably need more therapy than even those two uh, modalities. So when we looked at why would we intensify therapy, it's her percentile, it's the pr presence of the risk en enhancers, how much plaque burden she has, the burden of the non-calcified plaque, and the ability to truly calculate that we won't reach her goal with those therapies alone. So you can see her LDL trend is uh, dramatically improved with high intensity statin as well as Repatha. But remember we said we should at least shoot for less than 55, potentially as low as reasonably possible. So there are alter other alternative meds we can do. We could titrate Repatha, we could add Zetia. There's all these things. So I will put it in a discussion on what we would should, should do with this patient at this time. Um, Sarah, one thing I wanted to comment on uh, is, uh, I'm glad you pointed out what is aggressive uh, risk reduction. I think that's something that we often write in CATH and CT reports, but you know, it's important for us to really explain what that means. And and you, you laid it out quite nicely here. Um, I, I think we also kind of under-recognize these risk enhancers. And just in talking to you, I, th I think I'm going to be more mindful of that. Um, but uh, how, is it one risk enhancer that would then tip you into the more uh, aggressive category? I think it's looking at the patient in general, but if you look at the 2019 prevention guidelines, they actually say if there is a presence of risk enhancer to consider intensification of therapy. So family history is a risk enhancer, chronic kidney disease, HIV, um, all of these things can really enhance disease. So really it's not the number of them, but when you have additive ones, it tells you you have to be much more aggressive over time. So, so Sarah, Dr. Reinhardt, let me ask you this. These these uh, first two patients are an interesting contrast. And this is one of the, a, a question from one of our, one of our audience. Um, you know, if you're looking at a CADRADS report, they both be about the same. How would you, how does this information modify their post-CATH post-PCI treatment in your book? How often do you see, not just the medical management, but their kind of follow-up and sequential imaging, um, 
monitoring the, the frequency with which you monitor their response to treatment, et cetera. Do you think of these as the same or different and how? I think, again, it, it's they're, they're slightly different, but how you approach them is very similar, right? So both of these patients are fairly young with advanced disease for their age, right? So they both required revascularization. So we know just because they needed revascularization, your LDL threshold would be very low. But what this points out with a plaque volume assessment is, why is that? Is the disease out of proportion to their numbers? So it forces you to actually, once you reach that LDL target, why was your disease so bad? Do you have other risk enhancers that we don't know about that explains why you have this, this huge disease burden at this young of an age? Is there an LP little a? That's gonna be a huge topic of discussion going forward as these medications come out. Do you have an inflammatory condition? I don't think we're identifying inflammatory disease very well. And what we know is if you do have like rheumatoid arthritis or um, some of these things that the autoimmune medications can regress plaque as well. So looking for an HSCRP, uh, once you get your LDL to target LP little a, I think it forces us to look for those residual risk factors beyond when we get to that LDL goal. I think where this happens to be very helpful in non-obstructive disease is actually somewhat more important in some ways. So if I had a patient with a CADRADS of two, but you can still have this plaque volume, I think we're dramatically under treating that patient population as well. So having this plaque nomogram with patients with mild stenosis, but it's really diffuse, Having the specific targets for that mild disease is even more critical in some ways. And thank you. And, and Dr. Corrigan, how would you think about these two patients in their post PC? In the post PC, yeah. I, well, well, they're quite interesting. Um, in, in in the first patient I, I presented, uh, you know, I, I was trying to think of the risk enhancers. Um, maybe we need to do a little bit more thorough history. But um, j just cursory, based on looking at his immediate family, uh, he didn't have an early history of MI, but we haven't checked an LP little a. Uh, we actually haven't checked a CRP either. So th these are type of things that I think we need to look into. Uh, managing his patients isn't just about managing their LDL. It's about taking the whole uh, patient situation uh, as a whole. Um, and then again, these, uh, Sarah, these uh, lipid numbers are quite impressive. The amount of therapy this patient needed to get under control and using uh, the nomogram, use showing patient their plaque can really help uh, help the conversation where it's sometimes difficult to get these patients on uh, appropriate therapy. Yeah. And that, I, I want to move on, Sarah, just in a second to the rest of this patient's history and some of the family components, because they're very interesting and then this yeah. notion of following. But before we do, just one observation on the on the physiology side is would be the following, and, and Dr. Corgan, interested in your thoughts on this. The FFR, as you talked about for your patient, was clearly low, very focally dropped. Uh, Dr. Reinhardt, in your patient, there was right coronary very positive FFR, very low. The diagonals were, as you said, in the gray zone. So they were under 0.8. So if one were looking at them in sort of a binary way, they would be positive. But it's a very different sense. They're in the diagonals. And you said that in the cath lab then, they measured them invasively, uh, decided not to do anything. I just wanted to, Dr. Corgan, to your, going back to that earlier question from an audience member, how you use the information from FFRCT in thinking about, especially people with multivessel disease, does the level of F, how does the level of FFR factor into your decision making about do I need to measure it in the cath lab? Do I need to intervene, et cetera? Um, well, well, certainly we can have borderline lesions, uh, smaller vessels where I think it might help guide, you know, does this patient need revascularization? And Sarah, in your case, uh, the patient had a pretty large right coronary. So, uh, you know, that, that, certainly uh, probably benefited from revascularization, but you know, the diagonal branches are, are a whole lot smaller. Um, so, uh, you know, FFR could be helpful if, uh, if 
you know, it was maybe a larger diagonal branch, but, but, you know, I, I agree with what happened, uh, you know, treat the larger vessel that probably had the largest territory. And um, I, I'm not sure if they did invasive FNR on that, probably didn't need to. Um, but, but it sounds like the patient's doing quite well um, symptomatically. Right. And Thank I you. think one component of that that I would comment on too is if that plaque in that diagonal had been different, would I have been more aggressive or, or talked to the interventionist ahead of time? It was pretty densely calcified, right? So whenever I see a gray zone FFR, I look at the plaque components um, and the patient's symptoms as well. So if they had only had um, maybe say it's in a larger vessel with a, an FFR that was similar, 0.77, but it's in a larger vessel, but high risk plaque, I would be more aggressive in talking to the interventionalist, especially if they had those classic symptoms. So I think plaque components and putting that together with what the FFR, as well as the size of the vessel are very critical going forward. Right, thank you. And, and right. Sarah, just to, just to be clear, what, what, what you mean is that if it was all calcified, that's more stable plaque than- Correct non-calcified, low attenuated that has much more chance of progression. Correct. Yeah. So one of the things I want to highlight with anyone uh, with heterozygous FH is to really counsel them to check their children. So this is a young mother. She's 40 years old. And I advised her to have her children uh, checked for their lipids. And you can see each one inherited a different pattern of uh, her mother's uh, cholesterol. Some of them, two of them had high LDL cholesterols and two of them actually had an elevated LP little a. So the, potentially the potential to impact not just this patient's care, but her children's care at a younger age to hopefully uh, impact them where they don't have development of diseases, where we want to strive on, on that particular patient. Because then again, when we look at this plaque analysis, what, you know, we, people will have follow-up CTs over time. Um, so what are our goals? We want to stabilize that plaque. We don't want to see that plaque progression. And we want to intervene when it is non-obstructive, but also not physiologically significant. Uh, as you can see in this patient population, or uh, patient profile, three and a half years later, dramatic almost doubling of the plaque volume uh, and hemodynamic significance in multi-vessel territory. So if we use this plaque to intensify medical therapy very early on, I think we will start to see dramatic improvements. Great, thank you. And, and before going on to the third case, let me address a question which came in and, and I'll address this one. And uh, certainly Dr. Reinhardt, Dr. Corgan, please weigh in. A question was asked about insurance coverage for plaque analysis in asymptomatic patients. So I would just say the following, that payer coverage, uh, the landscape is evolving for plaque. At this time, there are no commercial uh, payers who have stated coverage uh, for plaque analysis. Um, some payers do allow coverage for the CPA component, when there is a really high burden of risk factors in an asymptomatic patient, even there, uh, it's relatively sparse. Uh, I think you know that that there, as you heard from Dr. Reinhardt with the decode study, looking at the utility of this tool, the landscape is evolving rapidly. The pace of clinical evidence generation in this space is evolving rapidly, and we're going to hear in a little bit from Dr. Reinhardt about a new significant study which kicked off yesterday. Uh, so that's evolving rapidly, but just for the audience to know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an area that is changing, that the answer as of today is there is not coverage from commercial health plans for the plaque component, for asymptomatic patients, or actually for symptomatic patients, and certainly for CTA and asymptomatic patients, it's a, it's a little bit of a checkerboard. Uh, people should be conscious of that as they're talking with patients about what to expect. And before going on on that topic, I might ask both of you, maybe first Dr. Reinhardt and then Dr. Corrigan, as patients come to you saying, who, who are asymptomatic, saying, uh, I think I need a cardiac CT or I want to have a coronary CTA, 
How do you counsel them in that? How do you respond to that? So that's a really important question. I'm glad somebody in the audience brought it up and uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So maybe Dr. Reinhardt, we'll start with you and then Dr. Corrigan. So asymptomatic patients, I, I try you know, to follow the guidelines. Right now, there's no uh, approval for a coronary CT. I still typically start in asymptomatic patients, number one, by reviewing any CTs that they've had in the past to establish do they have disease or not, because I can generally define it just by looking at old CT scans that are in the system. So that's where I typically start. The second thing is I will start by saying, um, I will start with a calcium score. I think that will transform over time because we've just talked about the limitations of calcium scores and following therapy. But if the calcium score is high uh, on the calcium score, I'm actually getting approval for coronary CTs to really quantify and take that because we know with a calcium score of 400, number one, it has the same risk, but there's a 50% chance of an obstructive lesion. So there is appropriate use criteria for nuclear for that. So I have not had pushback once I document that they have that disease burden and getting that coronary CTs. So generally I talk through that. Now, when I practiced in Atlanta, we had a self-pay coronary CT program that was much more feasible. Um, so I would talk to them about those options there. I just don't have that for my particular patient population here in West Virginia. So I think it depends on where you live and utilize the strength of what imaging modalities you already have is what I would say I would start with. Thank you. And Dr. Corrigan, when people come to um, you asymptomatic, how do you counsel them? Yeah, uh, one of my favorite things to do is to look for the patient's uh, CTPE protocol from the ED just to look for calcium. Um, it's always interesting to do that, to do that during a clinic visit. But um, I, again, it's been my experience when the calcium score is greater than 300, uh, it's, we've been able to get coronary CTAs approved. Um, I, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense to go from a calcium score to a coronary CT, especially as we're able to uh, visualize so much more and determine hemodynamic significance despite high calcium scores. Um, so, so Sarah, I have also been uh, finding some success with patients that have elevated calcium scores greater than 300. And, and it, that makes a lot of sense if they have the same risk as known disease. Um, but, but obviously this is a space that's evolving. Thank you. Well, Dr. Corgan, let's go ahead to the, to our third case, please. Okay. Um, so, so this is a, uh, 51 year old vascular surgeon who, uh, runs, uh, 20 to 30 miles a week, uh, knew he had an elevated calcium score. Um, based on his 10-year ASCBD risk, he's in good shape. He uh, has normal blood pressure. He doesn't smoke. His risk was 3.2%. Um, he, here's his lipid profile. You see his LDL is 150. His lipoprotein A is low. Um, he also has a strong family history of cardiovascular disease with early MI. Um, based on his calcium score and the fact that he happens to know a lot about uh, cardiovascular disease, he underwent a coronary CT. Um, we can see the FFR images on the right and kind of slow decline in FFR values in the LED territory. Um, and here are his, uh, the images from his coronary CT. You can see that there is a uh, non-calcified and calcific plaque within the proximal LED. Um, looking at the hemodynamic significance, there's this slow decline in FFR value that we often see in patients that have diffuse mild to moderate disease. Um, again, if this was a patient in the cath lab, um, you probably wouldn't use invasive FFR because there's not a discrete focal lesion. Um, so it, it's kind of that type of disease that we see on the coronary CT. A lot of times people ask, oh, well, is the FFR CT wrong? I don't think it's wrong. It's just not a focal lesion. So there's not a discrete delta, although there is a change in flow throughout the vessel. Uh, the main thing is, look, there is a lot of plaque. And the reason we did this was to further understand his risk. Um, using the plaque analysis, uh, he has uh, 320 cubic millimeters of plaque in the coronaries 
in the LAD, 5% of this is low attenuated. That's about 3% of the plaque in the LAD. Um, and using the nomogram, his, uh, percent, his percentile is above the 70th percentile. So he has a strong family history. Um, his percentile by nomogram is well above the 50th percentile. So I, I, as you mentioned, Sarah, I would want to push him to certainly more aggressive therapy. And, you know, I, I would say at least an LDL less than 55, uh, as well as looking into, into other risk factors. I don't think we have a CRP on him yet. But um, this, I think, just really gives us a better picture of his risk and allows us to manage, uh, manage him better and hopefully pre prevent worsening of disease. So he started uh, resuvastatin 40 milligrams. Um, his 10-year ASCVD risk score was 3.2%. So, you know, it, it kind of did us a little bit of a disservice there. Um, certainly has an elevated calcium score. Um, as I mentioned, he is above the 50 percentile. So I, I, I would be more aggressive with this therapy. Um, and, and then the question keeps coming up, when should we repeat imaging? Or, or, or should we even repeat imaging? Should we wait until there's symptoms? Um, you know, be, being in the field of medicine, there's always uh, concern of progression. So, so how would we handle that? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, kind of ask the group what, what they think about repeat imaging here. But, but essentially what we've done is started Crestor and it's not time to recheck his LDL yet. So Dr. Hey. Reinhardt, how would you, yeah, how would you follow him? Yeah, so I would say, you know, when we're looking at this diffuse disease, it, you need to be very aggressive. It's it's a high amount of disease, right? You have a calcium score over 300. So we know we can get a PCSK9 approved in this patient, right? So first and foremost, we know because proximal moderate disease, calcium score over 300, you have them on a high intensity statin, I would push for an LDL less than 55. Just tips and tricks, documenting any peripheral arterial disease. Use your CT if there's atherosclerosis of the aorta. Use these thresholds to, to document when you're trying to get PCSK9 approval, but try and make sure that they're on a high intensity statin or you document why they can't tolerate it. But again, he has multiple things going on. He has a high burden of non-calcified. You've got at least moderate stenosis. He's got a family history. So he's got the nomogram. So I would push as low as reasonably possible in this patient because you've, and you can see the change in the FFR. And I would say this patient needs to be monitored very closely. You know, even if you don't do a repeat CT, right? If it, his symptoms are vague, put him on the treadmill, see if he's truly asymptomatic. That may be the one use for a treadmill. But I would say I would really assess, especially in a, about a two year time frame because it's about a 50% stenosis. Um, and any new symptoms at all, shortness of breath with exertion, more fatigue, I would have a very low threshold for rescanning, but I would by the recommendations right now look for symptoms. Uh, but talk to him, any change in symptomatology, we need to be more aggressive with your anti-anginal therapy. I would also shoot for a low, lower blood pressure control in this patient as well. By, by low of blood pressure control, you mean? Uh, Less than 120, so about okay. 116. Okay, okay. He, he He's running 20 to 30 miles a week, so uh, yeah. the, the treadmill test might... <laughs> <laughs> Might get the he's, a HFL, he's not a West Virginian, Dr. Cork. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let me let, let me come to there are a couple of questions before we go on, Dr. Reinhardt. I know we're going to talk next about the, uh, the, the your new clinical study. Um, before we go on, a couple of questions uh, that have come in, and maybe the first one, uh, Dr. Corgan, I'll put for you, which is uh, for diffuse plaque, such as in this case, and we actually saw something similar in, in uh, Dr. Reinhardt's case. Um, how do you report the FFRCT values uh, where there is not, and you, you spoke about this, there isn't a discrete stenosis, there isn't a focal drop. Yes, it drops below 0.8, but that's not really the full story. How do you capture that when you're reporting out uh, in a structured report this sort of finding? So, so great question. And, you, you know, as an, as an interventionalist, this kind of uh, 
kind of fits nicely into what we do in the cath lab. Um, with coronary CT and FFR CT, we're able to FFR everything. And that, that's not what we do in the cath lab. We, we would only FFR something that is a focal lesion that, that looks like it would be revascularizable. So, so in this case, um, you know, I, I, I don't see a discrete focal uh, pressure drop, although there is a change uh, throughout the length of the vessel. Um, specifically, uh, I don't see a delta FFRCT greater than greater than 0.13, which has been described as uh, a marker of of a significant lesion. And really, what that means to me is that it's a marker of focality. Um, I, I, I use the change in FFR value being less than 0.8, and that there needs to be a focal lesion when it when I describe that yes, there is uh, a hemodynamically significant stenosis. Um, we sometimes see uh, vessels like this when a patient hadn't got, hadn't got enough nitro at the time of the acquisition. Um, he had 800, so uh, 800 micrograms, so that wasn't the issue here. But in, in reporting this, what words would I use? I would say that there's a, a slow decline in FFR value um, without a specific uh, focal pressure drop which is likely consistent with mild to moderate disease. Great, thank you. Dr. Reinhardt, anything to add to that? And then I have another question from the audience to pose to you before we go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what Dr. Corgan said. I mean, again, I would, sometimes I report the Delta, it's very borderline. There is complex plaque. I would probably, you know, it's just all about how phrasing, I, the concepts are the same. It's just whatever works for you is that uh, it's, sometimes I will say the li the likely reason for the distal FFR is because of uh, sequential lesions uh, that are more moderate. So, um, but it bears, whenever I see the FFR drop like that, I, I always call the referring and I say, this patient needs to be watched closely and, and just do a personal conversation with these borderline cases like this. Right, thank you. Um, so one, one other question that has come in that I'll, I'll just address, it's uh, where was this nomogram published? It was published in Jack Cardiovascular Imaging last summer, summer of 2023. Uh, and it's now, that information is now included in the, anal in the heart flow plaque analysis. Uh, and there soon will be an online calculator that allows one to plug in the patient's information and uh, calculate the exact percentile. Uh, question though, Dr. Reinhardt, from you, from a, an audience member is as follows. Do you see new tools like photon counting CT providing additional benefits in plaque quantification? I would love your perspective on those images and what they may mean for this, this whole uh, field of AI enabled CT tools. So it's very interesting. I, I think it's a change in concept, right? Um, so I'm going to go back to how we look at the CTs in general. So we've been so focused on the lumen that we haven't been great at looking at the plaque at the outer border. We've so, been so focused on the luminal stenosis. Is it? Does the patient need to go to the lab? The plaque assessment's very different. It's about looking at that outer border. And, and there is a difference. Literally, um, we I've edited several contours recently on multiple uh, scanners. I think we all have to get better at looking at the outer border of the wall, regardless of the technology. And I think the alpha counting uh, machine, because its resolution is so much crisper, the the they're more defined borders, it's going to be easier for the artificial intelligence to detect those outer borders going forward. So I think with whatever generation of machine that you're using, um, I think we're going to be learning as we're looking at the technology. Just like we know that for FFRCT, if you've got a lot of calcium, you may want to scan at 120. I think there's going to be different reconstruction modes that are going to be helpful for plaque analysis too. So, but I do feel like the alpha counting machine in particular with the better definition resolution will enable this field to grow at a rapid pace. Great, thank you. So maybe um, at this point, oh yes, please, Dr. Corgan. Sorry, I, I just had a question for you, uh, Dr. Reinhardt. Um, how, uh, we, we brought up serial monitoring or repeat imaging. 
Uh, how, how is that going to affect the plaque analysis as, so say someone had a, a, a CT on a 128 and then they had one on a Natom Alpha. I, I don't know if we know that answer yet, but that, that's going to be important as we really get into repeat imaging. Well, I think there's always scanner dependence, but uh, there's also metrics of the scan, right? So we know that when you rely solely on Hounsfield units as a tool, which this one does not, you know, but the KV even on the same scanner, if it's different. So I think you looking at the old scans and make sure you're using the same kind of uh, radiation parameters may be important to compare scans. Um, but we're going to be dealing with this no matter what, just because the evolution of the CT machines is so quick. I think first and foremost on the artificial intelligence side, we have to look at, number one, prepping the patients the same, using KV the same. But on the artificial intelligence side, looking at your starting and endpoints and measuring, make sure you're measuring the same amount of length of each vessel, scan to scan. Thank you. So, so why don't we do this, Dr. Reinhardt? Let's let's go ahead to the last bit of this discussion, um, if you would. It's certainly our uh, privilege at HeartFlow to be supporting the Decide study, uh, which we had very exciting news kicked off yesterday under your leadership. Uh, so, please talk to us a little bit about that study, how it builds on Decode, what you hope to learn from it. So. Dr. Leslie Shaw and, and I are leading this uh, study, which is funded by HeartFlow, but it's the DECIDE registry. And what we're trying to look at is we know we have these plaque analysis tools. We've gone through certain cases, but how does it work in the real world? Number one is, is very important. How are we changing our management strategies? But also, how does that change compared to CT alone, compared to stress testing alone? All of those are questions we need to answer, but also looking at the outcomes downstream. So we're really excited to uh, launch this study officially yesterday with our first site. And we're looking at 10,000 patients at approximately 25 sites. And we're looking at real world setting, how we use this plaque analysis tool in comparison to standard management recommendation, how did we change therapies uh, according to this plaque analysis? And then we'll look at outcomes as well as biomarkers such as our LDL thresholds, et cetera, uh, to see how we're improving. Are we doing a better job at getting people controlled? You know, I think when we talk about coronary CT and the chest pain guidelines, we know we um, had better outcomes but because there was a higher utilization of aspirin and high intensity statin. But we also know we're still not reaching the goals that are recommended. So I'm hoping with tools like this, we'll actually start people seeing uh, people reach their targets more effectively. And this, dis this study is really designed to look at this in a real world patient population. So there's multiple different cohorts. So I, I'm gonna start with group three. We're looking at a stress test only group to see how medications changed after that stress test. But then we're looking at group one, uh, which is actually a retrospective analysis of looking at prior to the site launch, when you only had the CT coronary, what medications did you change and what were you able to achieve? And then on those same patients, we're actually going to have a delayed plaque analysis tool to see, and we're going to educate those referrings to see how did this improve their management strategy? How did they utilize it? And then group four is a prospective cohort where you have the CT and the plaque information at the origin. Um, so again, as we're looking forward to this, we're actually taking this uh, management uh, severity staging and medical management recommendation, and we're being very deliberate in sharing this as much as possible because we want to transform the care of our patients. So again, we coupled staging from mild to extensive plaque burdens with clear cutoffs of plaque clear LDL thresholds uh, that we want the patients to achieve, 
And recommendations on maybe when you want to go to the next level, if there are a high percentile or risk enhancers, maybe again, like uh, in some of our cases, if it's a proximal high risk plaque, you may want to go to the next therapy. But really trying to urge people to look at all of the medications that are available and escalating it appropriately because we're not utilizing the combination uh, therapies uh, as effectively as what we could be. So, and, and sometimes when we gave a talk at Sky last night, not all cardiologists want to manage lipids. So really couple, hey, I've got this CT result. I don't want to manage, but at least I know it's high risk. Let me get it to someone who's willing to do that deep dive for me. So and we're willing to really work and educate everyone because we want to see improvement in mortality downstream. So I think this trial, we will get a ton of insight in number one, the utilization of it and potentially really train people to uh, utilize this plaque analysis effectively. Great, thank you. So, uh, Dr. Corgan, in a second, I'd love your thoughts on this study. I know you're going to be involved in it as well. Uh, I would highlight just, and it's in the uh, it's in the uh, chat, and we'll find a way to share this. That this nomogram calculator is now live online, uh, and uh, I'm, we'll find again we'll find a way to share it. Uh, it will be on our website as well, available through our website. I would. Uh, uh, highlight that this nomogram, these are plaque volumes being calculated. They're specific to the heart flow plaque analysis. They're not uh, derivatives of plaque volume. They're actual measured plaque volumes. And that's what this nomogram uh, provides just for people's reference. Uh, Dr. Corgan, your thoughts on this approach and how this may fit into the, the ongoing kind of evidence generation journey for this whole field. Oh no! The the plaque analysis and and the evidence we're going to generate uh, I think is incredibly exciting. Um, using uh, plaque analysis, we're essentially looking at the things that cause heart attacks in the patient's heart arteries. We're no longer uh, just seeing who has a percentage risk. We're physically looking and seeing what's there. So, I, I, first off, I think it's incredible we're able to do that. Um, Obviously, this is different than a calcium score. We're looking for the non-calcified and low, low attenuated plaque that causes problems. And hopefully, hopefully we're finding it sooner and starting all these fantastic medicines that can really uh, reduce a patient's risk. Um, just looking at this slide, uh, it, it's I, I just a quick comment. It's incredible the number of medicines we have now that can reduce a patient's cardiovascular risk, whether they're diabetic with SGL2 inhibitors, uh, whether they're diabetic and obese with uh, GLP-1 agonists, um, even, uh, you know, medicines for elevated CRP, colchicine, et cetera. Um, there's so much that we're able to offer these patients that the, the idea, Sarah, that you mentioned, uh, some cardiologists aren't interested in checking LDLs. Um, that may be the case, but look at this fantastic arsenal of medicines we're able to give our patients and really reduce their risk. Um, you know, I, I think this is a, uh, you know, exciting study that's really going to be practice changing just based on everything that we have to offer. Right. Yeah, it is. It is striking. You know, if you thought back even 18 months ago that the table, the arsenal of medicines would be quite different than it is. There are things on there that wouldn't have been there 18 months ago uh, in this discussion. I guess, Dr. Reinhardt, for you is that as this study unfolds, as new if and as new agents become proven for the more advanced stages, presumably you'll be able to accommodate those and sort of modify if guidelines change, if practice patterns change accordingly. Is that fair? I think so, right? So again, I think that's the point of this study, that it's going to be evolving over time. So you know, maybe we get insight, maybe the plaque volume thresholds are different. Maybe we have to intensify that a little bit more stringently, but the concepts are very similar, right? So the LDL goal, we know those keep changing the more knowledge we obtain, um, but LP little a is a huge topic right now. All of these drugs are in phase three trials, but I think the concept is very strong, right? So if you're if you get your LDL to go and you think there's residual risk, if those uh, markers uh, prove available, you can consider adding that to this prescription algorithm. 
But again, I think the algorithm, the beauty of it is it really teaches you how to use those plaque volumes, leverage to the intensity of care, and then look at your algorithm. Is there something that I'm missing um, that we can say, um, is there a medication available for that? So again, that's why we added colchicine and, and vasifa at the bottom is you want your LDL at goal before you really consider some of those additive meds. Um, so that's the first and foremost thing I want to stress. LDL should be your first goal, diabetes control along with that. But if you've got residual risk, that's when you need to start looking for these other things. And I, the new drugs coming out at such a fast pace, you will see a lot of changes to this table as we go forward. Right. Well, thank uh, you. We're getting, yeah, Dr. Cork. So, sorry, I just wanted to say something I find interesting about lipid management. Um, you know, we have these drugs now, PCSK9 inhibitors and glycerin, that are not daily medicines. And, and it really takes um, compliance and, and things like that uh, kind of off the table. Um, you know, e even with aggressive blood pressure medicine or blood pressure reduction, uh, concepts like renal innovation, I think, really kind of advance how we can reduce a patient's risk over time. After all, these plaque volumes are you know, essentially we're looking at what causes the number one cause of mortality and morbidity in the, in the United States. And now we have all these tools to treat it. Um, if you look at what we do for cancer um, and, and all the serial imaging we do for things that, you know, al although they're, they're, they're terrible diseases, um, they're still not the number one cause of death. Um, and, you know, just, it's, it, it's exciting to be part of this. Well, let me let me close by thanking both of you, both of you, Dr. Reinhardt, Dr. Corrigan, for taking the time to share your cases and to share your insights. Uh, certainly, at HeartFlow, it's our privilege to continue to support this field, to provide tools which uh, may be helpful, and to do the requisite clinical studies to really inform this, to inform all stakeholders, including insurance companies and payers, of where the value for this lies. We've seen the clinical value, but you know, there's a lot of work to be done. And, you know, again, it's our privilege to be or carrying forth the responsible science to make sure it's done at a top notch. And thank you guys for walking through your expert, your cases, your expertise today, uh, and would wish everyone uh, a great rest of the day. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. All right. Thank you.